Disclaimer, this episode features a discussion of sexual assault at multiple points. If you wish to skip these sections, we talk about it at 15 and a half minutes, 18 minutes, and from 26 to 35 minutes, and at one hour and nine and a half minutes. Now, on with the episode. Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Air Marshal Ian. I'm Flight Lieutenant Denny. And I'm Pilot Officer Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we desperately try to reach the heights of Royal Space Force, the wings of Anayamis. And boy, do we have so much to talk about that we're going to just get right into it. 13 pages of getting into it. <laughs> so, Denny, tell us about the Royal Space Force. Yep. The Royal Space Force, The Wings of Honeyamis, premiered on March 14th, 1987 as the first official work of Studio Gainax and the, at the time, most expansive anime film ever made until, of course, Akira the following year. Honeyamis was preceded by the two shorts created at the 1981 and 1983 Daikon sci-fi conventions. The movie was directed by Hiroyuki Yamaga, but really it should be said that it was a collaborative effort between all of Gainax, as most of their founding members were deeply involved with the project. Yamaga as the director slash creator, Anno as the mechanical designer, Sadamoto on character design, and Okada as producer. Yamaga and Okada felt that the anime industry at the time was stuck in a sort of status quo that only reinforced itself, with the anime fans enjoying a series, then always looking for the next big hit, which really isn't all that different from nowadays. Their proposal described Royal Space Force as a project to make anime films reaffirm reality, with their desire being for anime fans to see the film and to reassess their own reality, rather than escaping into fantasy. We'll talk more about that later to see how well they succeeded in doing that. So. They initially made a four-minute promo film as a proof of concept to show the executives at Bandai who were financing the movie. Due to its more arthouse nature, the film also received plenty of interference attempts from the investors who felt that the property did not have enough merchandising and spin of opportunities. This includes pitching different titles to Gainax, such as calling it Myth of Passion, Young Morningstar Shiratsugu, Parallel Zone 1987, or The Wings of Requini. Of course, even The Wings of Honomize was an addition that was arrived at after much compromise, because the original title was just The Royal Space Force. Other things involved a demand to cut about 40 minutes from the two-hour film, which was vehemently refused by Yamaga, possibly taking the film away from Gainax, or even cancelling it outright, despite these 360 million yen that had already been spent at that point in production. Furthermore, the film also had a quite dishonest marketing campaign to make it seem more like the other contemporary successes like Nausicaa. This involved things such as depicting an insect on the poster that wasn't really important on the, in the movie, straight up reinventing what the plot was about to make it sound more appealing, and other such things. Though the film received good reception at the time, it was a financial flop, likely due to its unusual structure and story, though it did eventually turn a profit uh, through home video sales and is still earning that today. The film has also been studied extensively, as it was really Gainax's first work, though not their most popular. The 1994 date is not really a coincidence because this uh, is due to really when it came got released in the West. I would have said that critical opinion was divided in Japan at the time. Like if we just look at Studio Ghibli, we can find that Takahata didn't like it, but Miyazaki did. Or at least that's what he said to Yamaga's face. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, the West really took to it. And I think that's in part because it came like after Akira in the West. And so people were looking for something that wasn't just sex and violence. Miyazaki also liked the four minute pilot, which was one of the things that convinced Bandai to eventually finance the project. But now let's get into the summary. So Shiratsuga Lada wanted to be a Navy pilot, but he didn't really have the grades, and so he was shunted sideways into the Royal Space Force. This branch of the military is tasked with creating human-piloted spacecraft, but they can't even manage to launch an unmanned satellite. So as a result, Shiro and his fellow troops are somewhat lazy, unmotivated, and more interested in having a good time. Even at the beginning, Shiro couldn't be bothered to show up appropriately dressed to uh, the funeral of one of the other Space Force members. During an outing to the red light district, Shiro gets intrigued by Rikini Nondoraiko, a 
religious missionary type girl who is preaching and handing out leaflets, inveighing against the wanton sex and whatnot. And he decides to show up her house the next day. And when he tells her it's because of her preaching, she lets him in. They chat a little. Rikini is impressed by his job. She thinks it's neat that here is a soldier who doesn't fight uh, and that can visit the unsullied world of stars. The next day, when General Kaiden calls for volunteers to be the first astronaut, Shiro volunteers, which surprises the general and his colleagues. He's taken Rikini's interest as something of a motivating factor. He uh, takes to his training. He's a much more diligent, and this uh, surprises the general. But despite the fact that we now have a volunteer for their uh, mission into space, the Space Force is mostly unknown in the general public, and by those who do know it, it's unloved and it's poorly funded. During a test flight with the Air Force, the lower-ranking Air Force officers mock them, and they get into a fight, which is only broken up when Shiro vomits over one of them. Meanwhile, the generals first make back alley deals to fund his space warship, um, including indirectly from the royal family, and using it to pay a bunch of old engineers called the Space Travel Society. We get a bunch of montages, seeing the project progress and Shiro get more skilled. But we also notice that his relationship with Rikini doesn't go anywhere. He visits her regularly, he sometimes reads her religious material, but ultimately she doesn't want to make their relationship physical and is even angry at him when he suggests that she compromise with God. Um, although she is quite reserved in front of Mana, who is a, a girl she is looking after. During an engine test, Dr. Nom, the chief engineer, is killed and we learn that radical anti-monarchists are being blamed. There are protests outside the Space Force by people who are against the war, and who think that the money should be better spent on infrastructure and dealing with the homeless issue. Some things never change. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we learn that the rocket launch is being moved closer to the border, which is applied by the military into goading the neighboring republic into attacking them. This will hopefully destroy the rocket and let the military kill off the Space Force with, while saving face. All of this negativity gets to Shiro. He becomes more and more disenchanted, especially dealing with the press and, and seeing the protesters outside. And with his lack of a relationship with Rikini, he goes to her house and is basically in a huff. He won't eat anything. He won't sleep. And then this is where he decides now is the time to sexually assault her. Yeah, there's that. She she knocks him out, and he uh, Shiro does try to apologize and make up for it a little bit the next day, but Rikini says that she is to blame and that he is a wonderful person. We'll talk about it. We'll talk, we'll about, talk that. about it. But Shiro clearly doesn't buy this. He talks to his friend Matty about how he's starting to think he's the villain in his own life. When an assassin tries to kill him, he gets chased through the town. But he eventually tangles with the assassin, first stabbing them in the leg, and then when they try to shoot him, he ends up killing them. The final part of the movie is about the time of the rocket launch. There's some tomfoolery about. The general is trying to launch the rocket early to avoid the attack from the Republic, which they know is coming. But he does have to call the launch off when they strike even earlier than they were expected. Shiro eventually convinces them to continue through a grand speech, that they're making history and that he's willing to give his life for it. And as the rocket goes up into orbit, uh, the fighting does stop a little bit, as all the troops are shocked that it actually happened. The last we see of Shiro is him giving a bro is broadcasting a message to the people on the ground, saying that they should give thanks for being here and praying for mercy and for forgiveness. The film ends with a bit of a montage, seeing scenes from history about war and how things haven't really changed, uh, but ends with Rikini looking up at this guy. Dun dun dun. Just as a note, I think the military were also trying to prove, basically wanted to have an excuse to invade the other country. But... Yeah, yeah. As a note, uh, we know the character's called Shiro Tsugu, but we're probably just going to call him Shiro throughout the rest of this episode. 
just for simplicity's sake. I mean, they call it that in the film, so it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So let's start by discussing Shiro, since the movie is like entirely centered around him. Really, he's the only, the only real major character. We should say. Yeah, I mean, we have him. Then we have Raquini. And then at the very third lower bottom rung, we have Mana. And everything, everybody else is not really a character besides the fact that they have a name. Well, the general's kind of important. I guess he goes on the same rung as Mana. They're, yeah. they're there. The general gets a scene by himself with no other character. Yeah, actually, that's true. None of the other characters really get a scene by themselves. But let, let's talk about Shiro. Shoshiro, how would we describe him? He's comes from like a decent middle class upbringing within the context of the war, but either by nature or by how he has ended up as a result of being bad at being in the navy, uh, he's ended up as something of a slacker. He, he's an everyman. He's kind of the most average dude you can find. Even that's even accident by his design, because while a lot of the other people have something that kind of makes them stand out, they're like really tall. They've got a unique hairstyle in the way. He's just kind of a square-faced runt that's standing in the middle there with nothing to really push him out. Well, the most characteristic thing about him is his like slightly dopey resting expression. Mm -hmm. This is actually like a, an interesting character choice, uh, um, thing that we see uh, throughout the film is that although it wasn't really like Sadamoto's like preference, we went for a, a somewhat generic, almost kind of like ugly normal person character designed for all the characters. I mean, it adds to the attempted realism yeah. of the film, especially when we compare it to the four-minute pilot film, in which Wakrini actually looks a lot more what we'd expect like a typical Ghibli girl to look like, compared to how she looks in the final film. I'm glad that is the case. He is interested in flying, but do we think that he actually was initially interested in space flight? No. No, I, I don't think so. I think it was too much of a pipe dream for him to uh, for him to have done it. I mean, he wasn't even aware what a spacesuit was during the opening scene. Whereas the the like scene before the credits, he openly talks about being very interested in planes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's as as Ian said, he's initially kind of a slacker, but once he has his first meeting with Karini, that really kind of acts as a transformative spark that changes him, because it only takes that one meeting, we don't really know how long it is, but the day after that, he's immediately ready to volunteer his life to go on what could very well be a suicide mission into space. And he's, like, kind of making jokes at his colleagues, uh, that they're, like, performing a great thing, a great deed for science. It's, it's kind of almost a radical change in his character. I think it's just that, like, someone has shown an interest in him and, like, that the thing he is doing is important and that he matters. Like, he's been bigged up and he hasn't quite yeah. deflated yet. Uh, and I, over the course of the film, we can actually see that he is being deflated, that it's not really his dream. He's doing it, but he's not, he's not like, in, internally motivated from it, or at least not entirely. I mean, you could you could initially argue that it's, he's doing it to impress a girl, but I don't think then he would go so far as to actually volunteer for the mission. Like he's 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 not he's not a fighter, both in the sort of metaphorical and the literal sense. <laughs> he does a pretty decent job during the later action scene. However, as Ian said during the summary, he he fully refuses to actually fight during the fist fight that gets started after the test flight. Yeah, though that might partly be because he was very queasy. He was, but I also just don't get the idea that he was the kind of person to really stand up for himself either. He seems very conflict averse. Yes, but he is. He's quite respectful, I think, of like other people. He's he's not pushy about like his own ideals. He's interested in what other people say, and he's like willing to be like. You know what? They're actually right. We see this with Rikini and her religion. We see this with the um, the protesters. It's like, yeah, why are we spending this money on a spaceship that I am going to fly? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's also coming as uh, like part of the part of the film where he's getting really disillusioned with what he's doing. Mm -hmm. 
Because as, as we said, he starts initially like really gung-ho about this. This is going to be great. And then as it drags on, as he's pulled into propaganda job after propaganda job, he's made to sit still for interviews, advertise things on television. He's asked to really sell this mission to the public. You can really just feel all the energy coming out from him. And he kind of reverts to the character he was at the beginning of the movie until we hit his absolute low point with the sexual assault on Rakini. I, we, we, I think we can come back to that a little, a little later, but even that felt very out of character for uh, for for um for sure. At least as I did, it was mm-hmm. uh, like at no point had he been very assertive. Even with the assassin, he can't bring himself to kill the assassin who's been chasing him through the town until it's clear that they're not going to back down, and he literally is shot in the face. <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff that I read, people were pointing out that this happened after he saw the money that was uh, hidden in her boot. And yeah. somebody made somebody suggested that maybe he was reading this as that she was prostituting herself, which I did not get that impression at all. I just got the impression that it's a dangerous town. She was just hiding her money in her boot. Also, he didn't like seem to make a big expression about it when he saw. I mean, it. he kind of he kind of did after that because when she goes to give him food, he just kind of looks at her and then rolls over, like he, and doesn't even take the food. The specific, the specific, that specific scene is one that Yamaga regrets. I think he mentions it in the director's commentary, where it's just like the intent was not that she has been hiding money from Shira, which is how Wikipedia describes it. Yes, yes. Um, but, like, it was just, well, she gets her money, she doesn't really have pockets, so she puts it in her shoe. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. uh, like, the way she makes her money is from farming. Uh, I guess we've I guess we've implicitly moved on to talking about Rikini a little bit. Uh, I mean, I guess most of the cast is aware, because Akada also states that he thinks the audience gets confused at three points, the opening scene, uh, the rape scene and the prayer from space scene, and he feels that they uh, that it needed a little bit of a stronger structure at the film as a whole. That that was like the thing they regretted because yeah. a lot of people got lost in uh, what with what the film was trying to tell them. I don't really understand why he says that, but that's fine. That's probably because you understood the scene, but some people might not have. No, I don't mean just the scene. I mean the film in general. Like he's talking about. Um... Uh, he specifically says uh, 80% of the audience is thinking I lost Shiro's thoughts two or three times or maybe four or five and I just think like I I feel like you've made it fairly clear how he was feeling for like the entirety of the film especially because you tie it into like the whole situation in general but I don't know I feel like he's underestimating audiences when he says that Partly, but I mean, as Ian said, it's to us it still felt out of character for sure to assault uh, Rukrini at that time. And what is that if not us losing connection with how he is feeling at that time or his his thoughts? So the thing that I get with Rukrini is that although she is like our second major character, she is very one dimensional and not really uh, like fully fleshed out. We know that she is motivated by her religion, that she, like her entire life is centered around it. She goes home at night and prints out pamphlets, um, that her entire support community comes from the church. Like, to me, her entire character seems based around how she relates with uh, Shiro, both on a like belief level and on a sort of class level in some ways. Like so, so like go go on. Like, how do you see their relationship? Um, this is sort of unrelated, but to me, she sort of exists partly as like a structural device. So, like, uh, Shiro's meetings with her often like sort of precipitate changes in where in the arc of well, both his arc and the film, I guess. So, like, initially he's very apathetic, and then after his first meeting with her and. He gets all inspired by her beliefs and her belief in him. Uh, then he goes to volunteer to the pilot. And then um, when her house gets destroyed, um, then is sort of the start of when he starts paying attention to all the problems in society. Uh, and then that, along with Dr. Gnome's death, is sort of where he starts to get really disillusioned. Um, and then he hits his lowest point with the scene that we've have talked about too much um 
And then after that, he sort of attempts to go back to, quote-unquote, doing better. And also, uh, their final scene together, they exchange, I think, maybe four four sentences. Yes. Uh, which I think is maybe the best way they could have handled ending that relationship. <laughs> it's just sort of, a, just sort of an amicable goodbye. Mm-hmm. Though she does ask him to come back, but I'm not but, certain how genuine that was on her part. I think it was more of a, like, wistful see you again, mm. like, without mm. thinking she would actually see him again. Yeah, I would agree with that. She's, like, the transformative spark for Shiro that starts and ends his, and, like, affects his character arc. But I feel like there is more to her than just that, because we have the whole relationship with Mana, which is like an additional layer that's just her own, that can stand on her own without Shiro being there. This is what this is where I, I sort of come to it is that I don't really even feel that like they have like a real sort of relationship. Like they see each other very differently. Yeah. Like Shiro, Shiro is like, oh, here's potential love interest, and she's like, she's idolizes him in a little bit, but. Like, I think she doesn't want to involve herself not only for, like, religious reasons, but, like, I think to try and maintain that illusion. Yeah. She wants to keep him at a certain distance. We see that multiple times in the film. And he's quite annoyed at her religion, though. He's willing to engage with it more than some other anime characters may be willing to. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, say, I say he's... Re- I, I've, I said this, like, I think he is actually respectful. And I think in this case... Um, I think uh, it was it's Carl Gustav Horn in, in his article in the fans uh, that sort of says that what we've got here is like a, with Rukini is a sort of a realistic portrayal of um, someone who's had like a, an evangelical upbringing in, in like a small church. She does have her problems and but she's also somewhat sheltered. Like I think she invades against the world um, for like religious reasons, but I don't really know that she understands it. There's like there's a naivete there. And, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't know about that. Because... I think she's less naive than Shiro because after her house is destroyed, he's like, "Oh, I'll I'll get the state to pay for your court case. I'll get I'll get a lawyer." <laughs> and she's just like, "Oh, no, no, no." Well, it, it's a, I, it's, I don't want to do any of that. It's a different kind of naivety. Like yeah. Shiro is naive about the world. I'm saying I think she's naive about people. That is a good summation. One of the scenes I personally found most interesting is about halfway through the film, when Shiro is at his point, it's like he's really fed up with all the propaganda. He literally walks out of the interview that's about to happen. He takes all the money that he has and throws it to the homeless people that are sitting on the steps of their building. And then he goes and finds Ukraini in the um, red light district. And initially when he, she's always handing out flyers there. So initially he reaches out to grab the flyers and she's kind of like recoiling from that. And like, it looks like almost like a protective reaction. Then he grabs the flyers and starts handing them out with her. However, her expression is not one of like happiness and uh, like gratefulness that she's there, but instead she kind of looks almost disappointed at him. And I was wondering what you guys thought about that. That's interesting. I don't know that like she was necessarily disappointed in, in him, but I feel that maybe she's like frustrated that he would draw the wrong kind of attention. By this point, he's famous celebrity, and he's yeah. Standing there, handing out leaflets in his full dress uniform, he's like very conspicuous. And while I think she wants, while, while I think she sort of sees it as her duty, like uh, like the the people who do the like the Mormons who like get you on the street, it's like they they do want to talk, but they don't know, always want to talk with everyone. <laughs> mm. uh, and like I think they want to come to you rather than have you to them. Weirdly enough. Before we move on to talk about the thing that we've already talked about, I will say that Yamaga did feel the need to, uh, that Yamaga did joke that, in his view, Rakini was what Naushka would have been like if she existed in the real world. <laughs> okay. Sure. I mean, another part of Rakini is just her whole deal with non-violence. As, as we already said multiple times, she rejects fighting, even for her own sake. The courts, uh, she... Whenever Shira does something that kind of pushes her boundaries, she immediately stops fighting when Mana is present because Mana comes from an abusive household, so she uh, reacts very badly to people fighting around her. She starts crying. 
And that's where Karini essentially, I think she says, I don't want her to see any more fighting. It's, uh, yeah. Which is um, a good little moment. It's interesting how much we've talked about Rikini because she doesn't she doesn't take up a huge amount of time in the film, really. And it's it's also funny because like we see the same thing with the um the director's commentary. That Yamaga and Akai spend more time talking about Rikini than any other character. Um It's because as Freya said, she's like the thing around which all of Shiratsugu's story kind of focuses. And he we spend the most time with him. Yeah, I do have kind of like one last thing I kind of want to say with, about religion, which is that not well, I already mentioned that it's sort of very grounded. It's that although she sort of has this very like idealistic view of um, Shiro, um, one thing that um, Carl points out is that she doesn't present this doesn't get presented in like a supernatural or religious light. Mm. Shiro isn't a prophet, and him when him going into space isn't a culmination of anything. It's just a thing that happens in the world. So we need to we need to address it, if only so that we never mention it again. Okay, so some some films have like scenes involving sexual assault, and they're if not important to the plot, like at least sort of make sort of some kind of a sense. Like I don't think people were. Well, I mean, you can argue, but like one thing that again Carl points out in his article is that people don't really view this this scene, the rape scene from Blade Runner, in the same way that we view we might view this one, or for example, the one in Perfect Blue. It's there, and it's you could you could probably replace it with something else, but it doesn't seem unnatural, and with some level of warning, like people can sort of understand it in the thing that it is whereas this is something that has ruined this film for people um this is not me saying this about me i yeah could ignore this i i'm not ignoring it but like this is this is something that does get brought up with this film partly i think because it's so it it takes you out of it so Mm -hmm. much it's not glamorous or if that's the wrong word it's not important it's not even revealing of their characters it's just just there and it's disgusting <laughs> especially because this film like does take its quite like grounded and realistic like approach at times like we can't like hide behind the moe here <laughs> To hide behind the Moe would almost make it worse. So, slightly controversial opinion. I don't think it's gratuitous. And to me, it serves a clear purpose within the film of, like, the Shiro is at his absolute lowest here. And I know you talked, well, I guess, I don't know if this has been edited out by now, but we talked a bit about how you two found that it was, like, out of character for him to do this. I didn't find that. Um, I'm not saying it's not shocking. It's not that I think it's out of character, but more that it reframes his character. Hmm. Um, In particular, as to where he goes from here. Because after this point is where he sort of attempts to try and be a quote-unquote better person but is also, like, has a much more nuanced view of the world. I kind of wish that it didn't take him assaulting uh, a woman for him to realize that. So I guess what I would say is I don't think it's gratuitous, but I think they could have done it a different way. I mean, my, my thing with the scene is I agree with what you're saying, and my biggest problem isn't with the scene itself. If it's with the morning after, where Rakini apologizes yes. uh, for knocking him out, and she calls him a wonder. She says, "You're a wonderful person. I'm sure you'll forgive me." That's what was really like pulling me off from it. To me, that seems like it's a defense mechanism on her part, and it's partly that, like Shiro clearly thinks she's being kind of weird in that scene, but then he never really reflects on that later in the film. So that I, I agree that that is almost worse than the scene itself. So I don't I don't think that he doesn't reflect like he does have this sort of um, thing with Matty, but he is viewing it entirely through his own 
through his own experience of what he did. And then, well, I, I don't I don't want to say in fairness, but like in fairness, he has a ship to pilot uh, that's going to be happening like within the next days. Like it's, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of empty brain space. But I do I do think the film slightly devalues like Requini like perspective because we never really get it, which isn't necessarily bad. I completely understand anybody who says that it ruined the film for them. Um, and I, I'm not trying to like say that they're wrong. So one argument like in, fa- in favor of like the way Rikini acts in favor, I don't know, is sort of, again, I, I keep referring to Carl Gustav Ho- uh, Horn's article, but he points out that like, uh, while Shiro has had his moral feeling, so in her mind too does Rikini. Now, I'm not saying this as victim blaming. I'm saying this in that she has her own code of nonviolence. Yeah, and she and she knocked a guy out, and yeah. she is as shocked by her own ability to do that, I guess, as she is by his ability to do that. They both yeah. thought that they're these inherently good people, and then they've just done what they did. Now, if you are going to watch this film, then you can. I believe skip this scene because I heard that Anime Limited was going to make that an option on their DVDs and Blu-rays. I don't know if that ever happened. They said they would anyway. But if you are going to watch it and you are going to watch this scene, you might not want to watch it dumped because it gets worse. <laughs> okay. So in the in the Japanese, for example, we have. Uh, when Shiro asks Rukini to forgive him, she says, you didn't do anything. And Shiro said, replies, because I couldn't. In the dub, this you didn't do anything becomes, maybe it was because I smiled at you. And Shiro says, I couldn't help myself. Ah, there we go. In the original oh. Japanese, again, I'm quoting uh, Carl Gustav Horn. Uh, in the original Japanese, Shiro made no excuse for his behavior and Rukini didn't suggest that she was to blame for the situation, only that she regretted striking him. Um, whereas this is not true in the dub. Fucking so yikes. So bad. Bad. Very dumb. bad. I would like to give a quote by Okada just what their take, what his take on the scene was. Yes. There are conflicting takes from members of the production staff. Let's start with Okada. Let's, his was there is no simple explanation for that scene, but basically I was depicting a human situation where two people are moving closer and closer, yet their relationship isn't progressing at all. Shiro resorts to violence in an attempt to close that gap, only to find that that was also useless. The two of them never came to terms, never understood each other, and even at the end of, even at the end of the movie. However, even though they never understood each other, they are in some way linked together. And I, I feel like I can see where he's coming from at this point, because we have said at multiple points before now that they were never really seeking the same thing from each other. They were always kind of yeah. moving in conflicting directions. So what he's saying here makes sense, yet they are still inextricably linked, which is why Rukini is the only person to look up at the sky at the end. So would you would you like to hear the worst anecdotes from a member of the production team? Certainly. So um, Takami Akai is one of the original three members of Gainax. I think that's right, right? Yes. Um, and he is one of the... Uh, four assistant directors for this film uh, and also did a bunch of production design um he says in the allegedly in the uh in one of the commentary tracks that Requini reveals herself as a strong woman by completely forgiving Shiro and saying it it was her fault ooh boy that's not the worst bit though oh god <sighs> the worst bit is that he apparently mentions that he wanted to use animation reels from this scene as promotion material. And apparently apparently other people hid all of the materials from him, which is a good idea. Yeah, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I wonder how Gainax managed to make this film as like thoughtful and introspective as it is when everything else they've ever made is not like this at all. Well, besides maybe Evangelion, yeah, Gunbuster. Uh, I mean, Gunbuster still had a lot more jiggle and bounce to it. Most of their things are relatively like concerned with thematics, just in a very different way, you know. Also, Gainax is not one thing; it has changed. Yeah, yeah, it changed a lot. With that out of the way, perhaps we can talk about the about more pleasant thing. 
Um, like this is a very interesting uh, and like and sometimes like somewhat rich film at time. The world building, like the sheer amount of like production design that went into this film, is kind of the thing that everyone gushes over. At times, I would say they went a little over the top, <laughs> almost like. Uh, but they decided that they were that to make this film in a world which is very similar to our own. But they basically tried to change pretty much every detail that they could manage. Uh, essentially, they redesigned every single thing they could think of. If it's mechanical or has any moving part, it's been redesigned. As, not just like, not just things with moving parts. Yes, but a lot, most of those are guaranteed designed. Like pairs are mostly the same, but other things that have been changed are like fences have like their own fancy thing. Their money is like uh, little sticks. Their street lamps, their water pipes, their playing cards, their books are like have like a lot of edges. Their doorbells, their cutlery. Their newspapers are like single giant strips of paper. Their windows go down and inside the walls. Well, that window does. We don't really see them opening any other window. That's true. It's just every single thing of the world was redesigned to be something that is familiar to us, yet still looks strange and a little bit otherworldly. Yeah, uh, they they took their um their um influences from like quite all all over the place. There's a lot of like um, Asian. Influence. Is, but at the same time, much of the design is like very, like Art Deco and stuff at times. Mm. Yeah, and it's very like colorful, almost like folk dressy. Whereas we also have just the the attention to mechanical design that we gushed, I gushed about in the Gunbuster episode. Mm. Like visually, I don't think we have anything to complain about in this movie. Really, like mm. all of the mechanical things look gorgeous. The uh, the spaceship. Uh, all the cars, the trains, it's all visually very interesting to see. It actually had a really interesting process of creation where essentially all the designers were free to submit their own stuff based on their interpretation on Yamaga script. And then it would be discussed at a daily meeting to see what would get into the film. So presumably there's like a whole bunch of rejected designs for every single one of these things. There should be like a model of at least some parts of this city. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Like this is something that Okada mentions in a recent interview um, about uh, Anno having a model built for um, the rebuild of Evangelion for like choosing shots and stuff. Mm. I think I read something similar because they were using some. They were like mostly using live action techniques. Thus, they were building models to study where the camera should be, even though the camera, of course, does not exist. Well, <laughs> sort of does. <laughs> well, there is no physical camera that you need to be that need you need to worry about its placement. The camera only exists mm. in a metaphysical sense, because the scene could be filmed from any angle you want in an animated film. Yeah, it's technically true. Of course, the world building doesn't only uh, stop with all the physical objects. It has its own countries, its own currencies, its own food, its own measuring units. We've talked way too much about the religion, <laughs> even yes. though we've seen so little of that. We haven't really, we haven't really talked about its specifics. It's kind of, it's kind of weird because it has like, it has like the Promethean myth and is mm -hmm. monotheistic, but then the Bible is illustrated like old um, sort of Japanese scrolls. Yeah, I, I, this is part of where they're coming from. They've just taken their influence. Like from everywhere. Of course, Japan does have quite a sizable Christian community, so it's not it's not that odd. I mean, there is a lot of talk about sin and people burning. There, yeah. So, so they change a lot, a lot. But like, uh, as they point out, you can't change everything. Uh, as Yamaga says, you try to change the shape of rockets, but they don't really change that much, even if they wanted to. This is something that Miyazaki actually criticizes him for: is that the rockets <laughs> are shaped like rockets because fuck Miyazaki. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, we each get one thing that was the st what was the stupidest thing in the world? Oh, I kind of want to. It's the that. fucking triangular spoons. Those <laughs> really got to me. It's the goddamn wooden triangular spoons they used as ladles. <laughs> if they would just use as ladles, fine, I could see that. But the fact that they <laughs> used as eating spoons just got to me. That's my. No, 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 Denny, you, you put them in your mouth and then you suck the stuff out. That's how you used them. Yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was like they were, he was trying to eat natto with a tongue scraper. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, Freya, Freya, do you have one that you would like to call out? Uh, there was the one that particularly annoyed me, but I did find the upside down umbrella quite funny. All right, for me, it has to be the bike frame. It's not the only place that does this, but when you have a bike frame where the, like, the, like, I forget what you call it, the, like, the thing that has the handlebars on it is bent, like, that cannot support, <laughs> that cannot support it. It's, it's going to fold for Actually, sure. Actually, no, a little bit that did annoy me. Um, so all of the planes in um, the uh, Federated Kingdom of Honeyamis, that's not the full title, but that's what I'm going to call it, um, have rear-mounted double propellers that are sort of boomerang-shaped. And it's like, okay, weren't you testing jet, jet, uh, jet planes at the rear again? But I, was, I, was trying to, I was trying to find out if those were real, pa- real propeller designs, because I wouldn't have been that surprised. But no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find those. Yeah. And I did find there are some doozies. But then later, it turns out the Republic does have jet planes that they use regularly. (laughs) Which makes... Which is very silly, but you know what, whatever. I mean, it makes some amount of logical sense if we think about it in a way that they were simply pawning off one of their old planes on the Space Force because they didn't want them to use one of their new uh, high-tech stuff. Well, no. The beginning is just like they're they're just testing one, yeah. Um, and all of their other planes are propellers, so I guess all of their jet research went into rockets. <laughs> sure. So everything was redesigned, but there is a reason for that. As I said in the opening, their goal was to make anime fans reassess reality. So I have another quote here from Okada, which I'm just going to read to you because it kind of explains what it is about. Uh, It is essential to pay close attention to the smallest design details of this world. It's because it is a completely different world that it must feel like reality. If you ask why such an approach, when the goal is to get anime fans to reaffirm their reality, it's because if you were to set this anime in our actual world to begin with, that's a place which right now they see as grubby and unappealing. By setting it in a completely different world, it becomes like a foreign film that attracts the attention of the audience. The objects of attraction are not mecha and cute girls, but ordinary customs and fashion. If normal things now look impressive and interesting because they've been seen through a different world, then we'll have achieved what we set out to do in the plan. We'll be able to express reality is much more interesting than you thought. I can't believe you I can't believe you quoted an entire paragraph. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a big quote, but I really feel like because I was going to say, like with Okada, you can always find a quote of him contradicting himself, but the one I have actually isn't him contradicting it. He's just basically saying that he understood that Miyazaki wanted to raise young people's spirits with his kind of fictitious wor- wor- film worlds, but our generation knows it doesn't work that way. We know children feel that way, but we're well aware that we don't. He doesn't fucking understand Miyazaki's films. But that's <laughs> he but, I mean, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there, but to me, this kind of this quote like really changed how I saw the film because I, I watched the film three times. Like, the first two times, I was kind of more iffy on it. It was it, w- it was okay. I never felt like I was getting it. However, when I th- viewed it with this lens in mind, as as kind of our reality but slightly different, as something that's m- supposed to make me think about our own world, then the film made so much more sense to me because. Shiro makes so much sense if he's the stand-in for the everyman, the kind of average Japanese middle-class person that's living just fine, neither rich nor poor. Mm. Uh, He's just kind of drifting along through life, not really suffering, but not really, air quotes, living either. And then he finds the spark that is space travel through Rukrini, and it kind of changes his outlook on life. If that's what they were trying to accomplish with this film, they were trying to get people to see themselves in Shiratsugu, and then look for that spark in their own life. That, that kind of really changed how I saw the film, mm. with him as the audience standing. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, it was just that... Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, it's just that the way you said it, I was just thinking of Con Marie asking if this film sparks joy in you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, this theme feeds into the other major theme of the film, which is all about, um, is progress good or not? It's complicated. 
Uh, also, like, should we hold to our ideals or should we compromise? It's yeah. complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically with uh, what you're saying with this, like we're getting, we're trying to get people to reassess reality, is they then include a bunch of things that are sort of contemporary problems in Japan. Well, well, in a lot of places, really. I mean, they're they're very common problems that play humanity to this day. Like we're doing big space tech development while uh, people's houses are getting uh, destroyed for the sake of. Uh, building more power plants while there's a big unemployment and homeless crisis and while the whole thing is just a pretext for the military to launch a uh, war i mean the debate about compromises is literally had in the film by rakrini and shiro because he he suggests that you should maybe compromise a little bit because compromises have made life much easier for everyone or that they're living much better now but she says that she's doing just fine and she doesn't want to compromise because that's a that's what's led to the world as it is currently, which she sees as sinful and arising from evil. Mm. There's also a weird like class element to this because Shiro, uh, Shiro, Shiro uh, feels sort of insulated from most of the problems for like the first two quarters. Mm. Um, I don't know why it's the first two quarters instead of the first half. Whatever. Um, and then he, after Requini's uh, house is destroyed, he starts to like notice all of the, all of the protesters. He even starts to agree with them a little bit, though not in a way that would actually like endanger him at all. Yeah, he's realizing that there are real problems that he could do something about with his newfound popularity and fame, but he doesn't really do anything that would affect his own position. At mm. most, I think the most he does is like talking to some of his colleagues or making a silly face on a propaganda picture. There is like a point in the film when uh, one of the like the journalists goes to him and like is like, well, what about feeding the poor and stuff? And he's just like, uh, uh, uh. He just walks off. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of uh, almost limply, like there's the shot of him looking at the um, yeah, and homeless people on the uh, stairs and he just sort of limply throws some money at them. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think he's. Uh, he's uh, just. He's. He's so used to like not having been able to really do anything as part of this like <laughs> bullshit space force that he's like now confronted with all these problems and doesn't know what to do and he's just like. This is also at like his lowest, close to his lowest point in the movie yeah. when all of that energy and vigor he acquired initially, as as Ian said, really deflated and he's kind of back to being this hopeless person that he was at the beginning. Then of course we have the scene and after that he kind of tries to build himself back up again but this time in a more real sense now he's after that he's just more sort of dedicated to getting to space without like worrying about any of the larger uh like propaganda about the country being like, oh we're gonna be the first ones to get to space is it a, do you think it's a little bit of an escape for him yeah to go to it, space yeah. because it's it's do what you can do do we think he expects to come back Yes. Sure. And he does come back, or at least according to the end credits. So if if we're if everything is like the reality but a little bit changed, then I assume the old military council that we meet uh, at one point in the film is just a stand-in for like all to to guidance for all the old people that are kind of controlling the world to their whims and not really caring about the wonder and imagination. Uh yeah. That's that seems about right. It's interesting because those the uh, the defense uh, ministry, the leadership is coded very much, at least to me, to be like Imperial Japan. Both the like the way they're sitting on their cushions, uh, the hats, and the music during the scene sounds like Imperial court uh, court mm -hmm. music, which makes it very interesting to compare to Gunbuster uh, because. They are portrayed as being, well, more accurate to the actual Japanese military, really. Um, they basically just want to use the Royal Space, the uh, rocket, as a big false flag operation in order to bait the other country into uh, attempting to destroy slash steal it. And uh, then use that as a pretext to start war, which is 
Kind of similar to the Manchurian incident, but with the um, players switched around, because that was like a unit of the Japanese army trying to uh, bait the uh, military command into invading um, another country, but, you know, whatever. So, yeah, interesting to compare that to Gunbusters. Japan is the global superpower. Unambiguously good. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's what I was saying earlier. I find it quite curious how they made this as their first work, and then they went on to make Gunbuster. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Wings of Honomize doesn't really feature any like voyeurism whatsoever. The only scene of that we have is through Shiro's eyes. Gainax thing didn't really occur until until Gunbuster. There is yeah, the, yeah. there is the um, the red light district, but even there, they're quite modest. In draft. I do think where this falls down a little bit is that the Republic is just kind of othered in every single way they can do it. Their, like, customs feel way more, like, fantastical than uh, the uh, the Federated Kingdom. Like, they have weird animals. Uh, they speak in a sort of dodgy um, conlang that feels like it's based on Swahili, which I swear, like, every sci-fi thing does for its aliens. And also they have like a sort of a cross between um, like Kabuki makeup and Bindi's, uh, which is not great. And there's also like a weird thing where most of the soldiers are like lighter skinned, but the command is darker skinned, which feels which is really dodgy. I kind of wish they had just never shown her, us the like command of the, the like military command of the Republic and just left that out completely. I mean, I don't think it really adds anything. Yeah. I think it kind of makes the film worse. I definitely, I don't know if I've already said this during the episode, but I definitely think a good 10 to 15 minutes could have been cut. And a majority of that would have been the those scenes, because they're just, because the enemy works just as well if it's a big faceless entity rather than a few a specific old man. Or if you were going to try and humanize them, actually humanize them and don't yeah, employ yeah. every other technique you can. They even have, for their military uniforms, they have stupid, like, 70s Gundam or Yamato like <laughs> uniforms. Looks really silly, like Swiss Guard almost. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough about that. It's a very detailed world, but personally, I think the the story of how it came to be is almost more interesting than the film itself. I don't think there is any anime which uh, is so easy to find out ridiculous amounts of stuff about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've already talked a little bit about about Yamaga, who's responsible for the concept, the screenplay, the director. I think this is the only movie that he has directed, and he like kind of took a break for about fourteen years after this to run Gain <laughs> to run Gainax. Of the of the main thing, um, of like the first four or so of his work of the Gainax works, he wrote three of them. Of course, he directed the um, the Daikon OVAs. I think it would be it would be good. To, uh, one thing that I would like to know is why. Uh, but like why he ended up as president when like it, it's clear like he has he had so much more to give uh, it's possibly they thought he would be like a good organizer i guess but that's weird because like gainax had like so many like people who were involved in like organizing early th uh, uh organizing like conventions and stuff like like we've put, we've mentioned that everyone has like sort of pitched it like pitched in a lot of their ideas but like the story itself follows like the sort of the classic um uh Kisho Tenketsu form, the um the four act uh introduce, develop, twist, conclude. Um the twist of being of course the uh two scenes we talked about, the the assassination, which we've given very little sh shrift to. Because, I mean, it's just like a 10 minute long scene that doesn't really affect all that much. <laughs> yeah, it's the like James Bond moment. Like, all right, we've got to have we've got to have a tank go. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> we got to have a, a street cleaner. A street cleaner. Somehow, even in all the like anachronistic technology level in this film, the street cleaner feels like the most egregious thing. And I mean, it's the one thing that's essentially unchanged because it looks fairly normal. Yeah, that and the rock. Uh, well, a lot of the mechanical stuff has been taken over because the. I mean, as I already as I mentioned in the yeah, Gunbuster. We have quite a lot of mechanics geeks. The, the yeah. early Gainax stuff. One of these sort of interesting things is that it comes across to me, at least the story, as almost like a collage. Like 
like if you're reading like a novel or if you were to use the term slice of life, but not in the sense that we use slice of life now, it's mm -hmm. overlapping vignettes of stuff, but they also like to include things like here is a film reel of a plane blowing up and yeah. here is the new news footage and stuff. It's it was I, I didn't do my usual um method of recording the um this episode summaries and I kind of was a bit more interpretive with it just because it was like well it's going to keep flipping between stuff every five minutes what do you want to talk about yeah i mean there's also the bits where the character the other characters of the space force just talk directly into the camera like either addressing the audience or shiro it's not really clear to me which one they're talking to but i think i think when people sort of refer to this as sort of like art house or whatever i was i was making fun of it when watching it but i think this is kind of what they mean is that I wouldn't say it's cerebral or that you really need to think that much, but it's not as easy to explain as like the plot of, of well, I've since mm. already said it, a James Bond movie, <laughs> where it's just like, all right, he gets the gadget, he gets the girl, he gets betrayed. There's, I think, I gets a new girl. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I would call it meditative instead of cerebral. I, I think that's fair because we. I think mm -hmm. De Denny already mentioned this, and I would say the same thing. I think this is a film that really rewards a second or third viewing, just so that you can just sort of let it let it sink in. <laughs> you need to sit with it. You need to just sort of like just just let it percolate in the in the old brain. Yeah, though I think they make the like core thing of what they're going for fairly clear enough on a first go through. Mm. If you're watching it by yourself and not with a group of assholes who are commenting on every, <laughs> on every scene, like we do. Yeah. Um, I think part of the unusual structure could also possibly come from the same reason we have so many varied designs, because much like the uh, creative, the design process, the writing process wasn't that different at times, because Yamaga says, uh, I don't have it in his echo, but I remember him saying that essentially everybody was free to pitch their own ideas to the thing, and then it would get voted on. So maybe some of those more experimental things were things that were just thrown that weren't part of the original vision, like like the interview footage, like the reels. But somebody just thought that was cool, and everybody agreed. Thus, it was in the film. I think Yamaga says at one point he barely had to do anything because everybody else was directing. Mm. It's neat. I would I I I would like to say a lot about the animation, but again, like there's just too much fucking stuff to say. Um, I guess there are a few things that I could uh, shout out, though. One is just like, uh, as I said in Gunbuster, just all of the beautiful machinery, particularly in the finals. Mm -hmm. Like with the plane exploding, there's um, stuff by like Anno, where it's just, it's the wonderful um, paint splatter explosion that I love so much. But what, one scene that is really, really good is animated by Toshiaki Hontani, which is not a name that I was familiar with. It was the, the video I already mentioned of the rocket that goes up and explodes. Not because it's like necessarily the best animated, but because it's just like so weird and out of place. Mm -hmm. You see the screen like framing around it within within the view. It's all I wouldn't call it sepia toned, but like the like the like dirty green um color of old film. And like I say, just early gamex you get a ton of ton of really good effects. I think my favorite scene, though, is like right at the beginning when um, Shiro is like watching the plane like fly off. Literally the opening scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's like when I said in Gunbuster, there was like just the scene with the um, the laser array that I really <laughs> enjoyed. Like this is this is that. The backgrounds in that scene are fantastic. I mean, I think my favorite cut of the movie was... Uh... Uh, a cup where we see Shiro coming out of the out of the bar that he was in previously, and he sees two cops like roughing up a little child, and then it kind of flash cuts to him sitting in the interview, and I just really like that cut because it 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 really just worked for where he was at that moment, and the story kind of disillusioned again. That was such a weird scene, and the only instance of police brutality that we. I also think they could probably could have cut one of the two montages, the training montages, out. Yeah, there there were at least three montages yeah. in this thing, and like like I say, uh, there's a lot that could be cut. The last one is particularly like um, visually different from the rest of the film. 
uh, the like line. It's like more like scratchy in a way. <laughs> That's not the right word. It feels like there's more dirt in that ending montage than the rest of the film. How about music? Yeah, like uh, what? What about the uh, the 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 sound direction? The sound. There are some oddly cartoony sounds in this film at times. <laughs> Especially the like rock that falls at the beginning and makes a like really silly like chunky like rock falling sound. Other than that, it mostly just tries to be like as realistic as possible. I say there's a couple of moments where all the sound cuts out for like uh, especially like the beginning of the rocket launch when the um, engines like go on fully. Uh, there's a brief moment of silence before the rocket noise kicks in. It's a very minor thing to nitpick. I did feel that sometimes the the uh, the mixing wasn't great. The sounds yeah. were too loud, particularly in that final montage when they ro- it gets really gets upped. Um, but you know you can't have everything perfect. I personally didn't notice too much of the sound, but that's probably because it was doing its job and making the world sound realistic. The only thing that stood out to me was at one really odd moment where Shiro was doing like a scream of frustration that sounded really. Just kind of like a, uh, rather than a proper scream of frustration. That just really stood out to me. The voice direction was occasionally a bit weird. The only sort of like less diegetic sounds, I guess, is that at the beginning, there's like a baby crying, uh, sort of ethereally in the background as she was going to watch the thing. And then later during the montage, there's a bunch of baby and children sounds, uh, which was interesting, I guess. So the the instrumentation like leaned quite heavily on strings, but also on synth. The the only like actual string instrument I heard in it is sort of a violin in Rikuni's theme. The rest of it all felt like synth strings to me. Um, but the so but like the use of synth is like very tied in with the fact that one of the composers, I think Daniel already mentioned at the beginning, is uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto. So um. This is a guy I am a fan of. He's a musician and composer. Yeah. He mixes Western and Japanese classical influences. Probably the most famous composer we've had in this uh, podcast so far. Uh, I was very annoyed because several sources I read would insisted on pointing out that he scored Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which is true. But he's done so much more, and including <laughs> just an anime working with on the 2004 Appleseed film. The the reason I think everybody talks about Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, is because the main theme from that feels like it sort of became its own mini genre. There are so many like tracks in anime and in actual like Japanese pop music that feel like they're riffing on it. But it's... like, yeah, but this is the thing, right? Is that I would say I to me I associate him with the Yellow Magic or his group, yeah, where a very influential experimental electronic group, yeah. And they've all sort of spawned off different things. Haruomi Hasono basically inspires Shibuya K City Pop. Yeah. Uh, Yukiro Takahashi um, also did na- also did uh, anime with Nadia the Secret of Blue. He was like a rocker with the Sadistic Mika Band, and like their use of synthesizers was like very different than the sort of dance take of synths that you get from Kraftwerk and stuff, where it's meant to be artificial. They're going for these almost more natural sounding synthetic sounds almost <laughs> um so uh if they're they're so far they're they're quite far ahead of their time but they're one of those things which are so influential that they don't really sound ahead of their time yeah um because it just seeped in through particular 80s and early 90s video game music uh since i mentioned since i wrote it down i'll say a cover of their song kimi ni mini kyun kyun was used as the ending to noted trash anime maria holic um <laughs> If you want to learn about the Yellow Magic Orchestra, I'll link to a podcast episode by Blind Boy, which is quite good. As for how it's uh, used in the film, I think it, uh, the music uh, sort of forms part of the like reassess reality like uh, theme because it's like keyed into the world building that it sounds like real instruments, but you can also tell that it's synth. Um, and it's even used in universe. They play their silly alternate universe, like um, accordion bagpipes and the the silly like flutes in the marching scene. They make the noises that are coming from the the, the music. It's good. And interestingly, they only use a piano 
in the like first uh, quarter or so of the film, and only with things that Shiro is like strongly connected with, the plane and Rikuni. I thought the music was fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fuck, yeah, you, you, <laughs> fuck you, you piece of shit. <laughs> I like the Imperial Corp music. And with that, we come to the end of our discussion. <sighs> now is the time to render the verdict. Denny, how many triangular spoons would we give this? Okay, so I've now seen this film three times, and I didn't really enjoy it the first two times, but I actually really liked it the third time. So I think I'm going to give this a four. I think it's an overall really interesting film to watch. Visually, I have absolutely nothing to complain about. It's stunning. The, uh, the mechanical design is wonderful to look at. It's a, it's a lot of very interesting stuff uh, to see how they redesigned all these things. It's just so very interesting to think about a lot of the stuff they that we've talked about during this thing. All of these themes, the, the idea of reassessing realities through an anime film. It's a very grand goal for a piece of entertainment uh, that they've gone for here. I'm not certain whether they've succeeded, but I don't know if they've ever topped themselves with what they did here. So I'm going to give this a four. Uh, how about you, Freya? So I think this film is very, like, cohesively achieves what I think it's about, um, which is uh, reassessing reality and seeing that it's incredibly nuanced and the human world is kind of... It has a lot of problems and you should pay attention to them, disillusioned otaku. Um, uh, I have... This isn't going to affect the score. I have a minor issue with this sort of... Um, we're going to present a bunch of problems and no solutions um, type film. They're not bad in and of themselves, but it does tend to mean that they get like celebrated by both uh, lefties and fascists. Because <laughs> <laughs> they both got, yes, look at all the problems with the world today, and we're the ones who can solve it. Um, and given Gainax's uh, uh, founders' proclivities, I guess they're probably fine with that. But Denny, uh, but, uh, Freya, this is what Miyazaki likes. He thinks that the reason Miyazaki made the film honestly was because the film didn't suggest that the Space Force had done would change everything. Shooting up a rocket may give the characters a die for it first, but you can easily predict oh. they live in a world where they will be caught up in reality again. Oh, I, I like it too. I think it's not really, this is a problem. I'm not, it's not going to affect the score. This is just a minor like meta issue I have with this sort of thing. <laughs> Um, visually, great. Music works really well. Um, four, four spoons. Yeah, I think for me, it's going to be four spoons as well. I think this film was better than I thought it was the first time I watched it. I don't think it's amazing. I, I think it's good. I don't think it's amazing. I will say, though, that it is a shame that, unfortunately, people have finite attention spans because we do have like another hour's worth of material. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't even talk about Uru in Blue, the supposed sequel that they've been trying to make for 20 years and is never going to get made. Donate to our Patreon to get our bonus <laughs> episode where we talk about everything else. <laughs> uh, there is no Patreon. Do not donate to the There Patreon. may be a bonus episode, though. I don't know. I don't I'm too tired. <laughs> no, right now. Okay, so yeah, we're agreed. Four, four spoons. Pretty good, pretty good movie. Glad I saw it. A full set of spoons. <laughs> <A> full set <laughs> of spoons. Uh, we can all get one and the audience can have one. Okay, do we have any other fun facts? I do have one, and it's one of my favourites in a while. In some smaller cities, the movie was shown as a double feature with the 1985 made-for-television film Ewoks, The Battle for Endor. I just want to know who was responsible for this. Yes. What you were thinking of. I don't know, but <laughs> it's just, a, it's a very curious piece of trivia. Either of you have any, any interesting pieces of trivia? I have a stupid comment. Um, so that, that scene was cut out of the first UK home release um, okay. in order to get the film a PG certificate. When interviewed by uh, a magazine, the BBFC, which is the British Board of Film Classification uh, Examiner, called the scene a wholly gratuitous um, assault in the middle of a film which was otherwise a wonderful experience for younger viewers. 
but not only do you get a bonus fact, you get a bonus hot tea. <laughs> well, actually, no, you don't. But um, the thing that I was going to mention uh, that I was going to mention is that there is a reasonably common take. Uh, it was so obvious that I came up with it myself, which is that the Royal Space for- for- Force is supposed to be a stand-in for Gainax themselves. Which, aside from the parallels in the story, uh, which is a little flaky in my opinion actually makes a lot of sense, not just because several minor characters in the Royal Space Force were based on Gainax staff, uh, whether that was uh, like the Republic aide who plans Shiro's assassination, that's based on Fumio Ida, or the director who suggests that Shiro wa- should walk out of the interview, which is based on Kiryuki Kitakubo. Uh, but also, there is in fact a circle uh, in the Japanese sense uh, called the Space Force. <laughs> who refer to each other by military ranks. There's your uh, there's your callback to the beginning of the episode. Oh, that's why we did that. <laughs> and uh, that's and uh, Hiroki Inoue was a representative of the circle when he met uh, Takeda about them putting on their convention. Okada was a member of the Osaka chapter of uh, the Space Force. That's such a deep cut. Why? Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get here, people. Deep cuts. Deep cuts into nothing. What will we be watching next time, Danny? Next time, we'll be watching a four-part alternate universe OVA as the sixth entry in a 47-year-old franchise that will never conclude because its author passed and writer passed away. That's right. It's Shin Geta Robo versus Neo Geta Robo. So look forward to that. We are the Anime Research Group a currently bi-weekly podcast coming out every second Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode, or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime, or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Bye.